What if I told you there's an alternative to the cars we drive today? It's more efficient because it has a constant RPM. There's no elaborate gearings, no transmission, no need for timing or cooling or carburation, so it has far fewer moving parts. This vehicle can burn low-grade petroleum or even other fuels, so there's no need for refinement. Well, if I told you this car was invented roughly 100 years ago and is powered by steam? You might not be terribly surprised because you may remember the battle between Betamax and VHS. The better technology did not emerge the winner despite having higher resolution, superior sound, and enhanced ability. It boiled down to the cultural usage, how the users wanted longer recording times and cheaper products, which is what VHS excelled at. We live in a world where we like to believe in survival of the fittest, in natural selection, in Darwinism. But that might be temporal. Or even just plain wrong. In 1989, George Basala published Evolution of Technology, and in it he argued that selection is not necessarily organic or natural, but it has four major components, economic, military, social, and cultural. Though Basala posits that technology does not evolve organically, rather artificially, it is worth contextualizing it to get a better understanding of his evolution argument. The pepper moth was predominantly white until the Industrial Revolution when it turned black to camouflage in with the pollution. The offspring were selected by a totality of conditions, environmental and biological, that prevailed at the time of their appearance. Artifactual evolution, however, is contrived, it's intentional. Think of racehorses that are bred to be faster, cows that are bred to have higher milk production, chickens that are bred to yield more meat, wheat that's bred to resist disease. Even the iPad has forced evolution. We didn't need it, we didn't want it, we didn't even really know what it was, yet people designed it for us. Anthropologist Alfred Kroeber illustrated this critical difference between organic and artifactual evolution of two trees. The organic tree consists of separate branches that split to form new species, completely isolated from each other. On the other hand, in the artifactual tree, separate types of branches fuse together to produce new types, which merge once again with still other branches. Inventions are shaped by economic forces. When Edison invented the phonograph, he listed music reproduction fourth in his list. Teaching public speaking ranked higher. We see this economic selection time and time again. Rogaine was designed for high blood pressure. So was Viagra. Play-Doh was invented as a wallpaper remover. Coca-Cola was first offered as an alternative to morphine. 7-Up was offered as an elixir. Kotex were originally designed to absorb blood from trauma. In fact, ambulances still carry Kotex for precisely that same reason. Gorilla Glass, which is found on many mobile phones, was developed in the 70s for automobiles and airplanes. In each of these cases, the vision of the inventor was trumped by economics and the technology evolved. Basala uses the water mill as an example of how technology was affected by other factors as well. Basala suggests the water wheel did not penetrate society despite its enormous advantages. The technological abilities did not meet the needs. We see this again in the 17th century with the step reckoner, which was a calculating machine, but the technology at the time was incapable of making the gearing precision enough. The water wheel was also culturally in front of the Greek and Roman gods who regarded altering nature as blasphemy. And of course there was an economic concern as well. Water wheels were an incredible upfront expense. Even today we see this dilemma. School districts could save time, money, and person power by purchasing self-driving lawnmowers. Unfortunately, this is an incredible upfront expense. We do see a discernible trade-off as we look at Basala's next transformative technology, the mechanical reaper. There was a quantifiable tipping point. A farmer with 46.5 acres would benefit in the long run by purchasing one. Of course, the geography of flat open fields helped boost sales, as did railroads to transport grains. McCormick extended beyond reapers and made the farm wall a powerhouse tractor. The company became International Harvester and would later drop the farming implements in favor of trucks and buses. International is still around today. Speaking of trucks, the military's reliance on trucks would help ossify their place in the world. Between the start and the end of World War I, truck production would increase tenfold. The proliferation of trucks, combined with Eisenhower's personal contempt for railways, paved the way for the highway system. The military is unapologetically responsible for trucks and interstates. The military is also single-handedly responsible for nuclear power, a promise for cheap, unmetered power that never quite succeeded. Without the nuclear bomb in World War II, it is uncertain that scientists would have had invested time, money, and energy into nuclear reactions. But despite the military's success with supersonic speeds, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in 1947, supersonic travel was never terribly successful commercially. In the 70s, the Concorde jet program, which cost taxpayers $1.3 billion, became known as a speedy and luxurious way to travel. But deafening sonic booms, incredible expenses, and terrible inefficiencies led to the decline in public interest. It is worth noting that there are renewed efforts to revisit supersonic travel. 